On this edition of Independent Sources, Reporters Uncensored, a new voice for international journalists covering underreported stories. Hollywood Dreams, a City College professor explores Hollywood's little-known Polish roots in a new book. And In the Line of Duty, a female photojournalist braves abuse in war-torn regions to bring stories home. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Zyphus Lebrun. And I'm Viano Ravinka. Reporters Uncensored, or RUTV, is an independently produced web TV and podcast series focused on underreported global issues. RUTV comprises a network of professional reporters from international news services and journalists from NGOs and foundations. The project was started by Tala Dulichahi of the journalist rights organization Reporters Without Borders. Gary Pierre Pierre spoke with Dola Shahi, who is now based in Zurich, Switzerland. She talked about the project and the difficulty she has faced getting it off the ground. Tala, Reporters Uncensored. Yes. What's that? Tell us all about it. I'm fascinated by this topic. The name is intriguing. Yes. Well, taking off uh, from my role as a senior advisor for Reporters Without Borders, I just met a slew of journalists from Afghanistan to the Congo to Tanzania to Uganda. And so many of them didn't have a platform to present their stories. Uh, there were many stories that just go unheard. So Reporters Uncensored started as an idea in 2009 during the Iranian uh, protests against the election coup. There were a lot of people out in the streets, and that was called the Green Revolution. And they were using their little mini cams and their iPhones and mobile technology. And I wanted to explore how to get those stories heard. So I teamed up with Livestream, and we started a show that would talk with these folks, civil society journalists, local journalists in countries. We have journalists that work with us that are based in Liberia, that are in Uganda, that are in uh, southern Africa. And we try to tap into what they're doing to create social change. Reporters Uncensored is really about journalists that are social entrepreneurs and are working toward social change in whatever area. It could be human, human rights, it could be trafficking, it could be um, working with uh, businesses to try to set up um, programs to get people more equipped to deal with climate change. It varies, but we've done a series of programs so far and we've been really happy with the results. And now we're exper experimenting with the mobile technology, looking at the different platforms, doing podcasts, writing articles. So we've got a very nice team. You are basically canvassing the world. How do you manage it? Uh, and how, how big is your, is your staff, if you will? Well, I'm preaching to the converted, Gary, because you are somebody that believes in social justice and believes in, in, these, in these causes. But a lot of the time, uh, speaking with local correspondents in their countries, there isn't that interest. It's not sexy. You know, what are the, what are the top videos that are watched online? You know, a kitten chasing a ball of yarn or a baby doing some kind of activity. Uh, it's not these social change types of programs. So it's really about trying to tailor what happens locally to be part of pop culture, essentially, to make it global. And so and how many of you are working on this uh, from, from the aggregation the part, just <laughs> making sure you get... Well, we have a youth correspondent that's uh, in South, uh, South America and Peru. Um, he does a lot of social change programs for the youth, for the young. So he'll incorporate music with, you know, street groups and what they're doing to kind of get education for people who don't have access to education. We have correspondents in Africa who will speak about or cover a story within their own beat, and they'll share... Uh, their experiences in covering those stories. Government corruption is a big one coming from Africa. Climate change, of course. We have a freelance blogger that works with us from the UK, uh, and we talk about race issues, um, what's going on with political parties in the United Kingdom, and as they get more conservative, is immigration a problem? Is it is it racially biased? Uh, Tala, what, what's your budget for this, uh, and how long do you can keep this going? 
<laughs> There's no budget. You know, everybody knows that with the social change or web TV program, uh, it's just something where people get um, their story out. So basically, um, you're providing a platform for journalists across the world so they could be their voices can can be heard. Is, is essentially is that what reporters uncensored is? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And we'd love to pay folks. You know, we are open to, you know, we apply for things and f foundations, but web TV is so, um, it's, there's so many people on the web that um, it's difficult to get people to get paid. But so that doesn't matter though. It's really about the journalists wanting the platform to get out to Western communities, to get out in the New York community, to get out their message of what they're work working on with their local beat. And we're just there to provide that platform. The the internet is almost seems almost endless. Uh, how do you market this initiative, and and how are you doing so far in terms of getting the words out and people visiting the site and watching these important videos? Yeah, it's challenging. I have a social network of over three thousand Facebook friends. I'm very proud of that, Gary. <laughs> um, and getting it out through our social networks online. That's what you do, and that's what works. Um, Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr and all the various stories that we can get out, we get out through social networks and through word of, of, of mouth, essentially. And people like your you know, network and other networks have picked up our stories. We do interview uh, high-level folks or folks who have a brand, essentially. Uh, we've interviewed Deepak Chopra. We've interviewed uh, folks from Comedy Central who are participating in the Arab comedians uh, ending stereotype type of forums. And so we have done things that have received a lot of hits. Um, but we're not really doing it for the hits so much as even if one person sees this show and finds out what's going on locally from a perspective of a journalist to a journalist, then I think we've made the difference. Well, so far, give us one example where a story wouldn't have gotten the light of day had reporters and censors not been around. <laughs> oh, boy. That's a really difficult question. Well, during the uh, 2009 election coup, in Iran, for example, um, myself being an Iranian American, uh, we spoke about social tech, media technology and social mobile technology uh, and the way that people got their messages out on the human rights violations being committed against them by the government on the streets as they protested. As you know uh, or can remember, a number of people were shot and killed. Uh, people were jailed, people were beaten in jail, a number of journalists ended up behind bars. And we have a correspondent that's Iranian that's based in Iran, and she has been most recently um, detained by the Iranian government. She was recently released for participating in a film uh, that the Iranian government deemed to be un-Islamic. So it's getting out the word from countries where there is a built stereotype, especially the Iran-America relationship, but really trying to break bread, essentially, with real people inside those countries who can explain what's happening and the fact that they are uh, open to uh, American culture and they are open to democracy. Tala, are most of these correspondents professional journalists or citizen journalists or a combination of both? Well, our correspondent in Iran is a filmmaker, an actor, and writes and produces films. Um, a lot of them are involved in social media technology. A lot of them are freelancers, and some, uh, like our Sahara Reporters uh, correspondent, uh, works and owns his own kind of news journal, but also contributes and gives us the Africa perspective, essentially, on various different situations within Africa. Where can we see uh, reporters uncensored? We are on the Huffington Post where we blog monthly um, on key issues. We podcast frequently. Uh, you can go to our website at reportersuncensored.com and see what we do. And then when we get back on the air, you'll see more um, of the kind of grassroots types of journalism that we like to focus on. Well, thank you. Good luck with the project. Thank you so much, Gary. You can learn more about the project and see the stories they've produced on the website reportersuncensored.com. Still to come on Independent Sources, we learn more about Hollywood's Polish roots. Before that, Abby Ishola has some other news.
Thanks, Zyphus. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media. The Amsterdam News reports that fewer blacks and Latinos are enrolling at CUNY schools. A recent study done by the Community Service Society of New York, CSS, revealed that the recession led to an increase in the number of applicants to CUNY schools. This prompted CUNY senior colleges to raise their admissions requirements. Applications from students with high SAT scores increased. As a result, enrollment of low-income students of color decreased, while middle and upper middle class white student enrollment increased. CUNY officials contend that their graduation rate among black and Latino students is at an all-time high. The Jewish Star reports that one national health center has seen a 500 percent jump in Jewish patients battling eating disorders in the last two years. The Renfrew Center, which runs facilities for treating eating disorders in several states, presented these findings at a recent seminar in New York City. A center spokesperson explained that bulimia and anorexia can be triggered by bullying, trauma, or a perfectionist attitude. Renfrew has a program for Orthodox Jews and offers various forms of treatment, including psychodrama art therapy, group and individual therapy, nutrition therapy, and mealtime support. From News India Times, Indian American groups have joined forces in a legal battle to change race-conscious university admissions policies. Colleges and universities are holding Indian American students to a higher standard of screening than white or black students. This means Indian American students would need higher grades than other students. Groups like the Indian American Forum for Political Education and the National Federation of Indian Associations filed an amicus brief in a pre-existing Supreme Court case to have the practice overturned. That case involved a white student who was suing the University of Texas at Austin for denying her entrance based on a race-conscious admission policy. Though the Asian population has grown significantly in the United States, many Asian Americans feel marginalized at work. According to a recent survey by the Asia Society, Asian Americans make up less than 2% of all chief executive officers at Fortune 500 companies. Several professionals voice their concerns about the problem at the Asia Society's Diversity Leadership Forum, recently held at the Time Warner Center. Many say Asian Americans need to discuss the issue more and begin participating in professional groups and social activities in order to help correct the issue. That from World Journal. And finally, from Turk Avenue, a classic Mercedes-Benz once owned by Adolf Hitler has randomly ended up in New Jersey. Zenup Tunser, a classic car repair specialist, encouraged his friend Fred Diabes, who is a classic car collector, to purchase a 1942 Mercedes-Benz he found on eBay for $175,000. When Tunser began fixing the car, he called Mercedes to retrieve its special parts. Upon giving the serial number, Mercedes informed him that the car once belonged to Hitler. The seller, who was unaware that Hitler once owned the car, said his grandfather bought it in 1951 when he was a U.S. military officer serving in Germany. Those were just some of the headlines from the ethnic and community media. Back to Zyphus and Vianora. Thanks, Abby. You may know that Samuel Goldwyn produced the first film shot in Hollywood, and Louis B. Mayer was an innovator of the studio system. The two men co-founded Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studio, more commonly known as MGM. What may not be common knowledge is that both these men were Polish. They're just two of Tinseltown's Polish pioneers, profiled in Andrzej Krakowski's book, Hollywood. The City College professor joined me in studio to talk about this often overlooked aspect of Hollywood history. Professor Krakowski, how did you come up with the idea of writing a book about Paul's contributions to Hollywood? Well, the germination was quite long because the, the whole idea started in 1995, where the, there was a friend of mine who came from Poland to collect some artifacts for for Polish Museum of uh, Cinema Arts. They had the, an 100-year-old uh, exhibition. Uh, and um, and he asked me, we were sitting in Manhattan at the, the, at the coffee shop, and he asked me if I know any Polish or any pioneers of American film industry that had Polish roots. And I asked him, how much space do you have? And he said, well, I could find a little corner. I said, well, I don't know if it's enough. And I started to rattle off the names of, 
actors like Walter Matthau, Jack Palance, people I worked with. And, and he said, oh my God, that, that requires an entire exhibit. And I said, well, go ahead. And they never made an exhibit you know, about this, but uh, the idea started. And you've compiled uh, a list of all the poles that have contributed to the early development of, uh, of Hollywood, or did you cover a particular time frame in this book? Well, I started to compile a list and to say, you know, to, 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 to state that I compiled a list of all the polls. No, the, the, the list is still growing. I'm finding more and more and more and more. And right now there's more than 450 names on it already. So I couldn't, obviously, I couldn't write a book about 450 individuals. So what I did for the first book, I, I, I selected 10, 10 real pioneers, and each of them started another branch of, uh, of the industry. Give us some names. Well, I started with uh, Sigmund Lubin, who created a movable projector, and that opened up a possibility for theaters. Before that, people were watching movies on a kinematoscope, which was one person, one movie, cranking that little crank, and, uh, and this uh, movable projectors you know, opened up a, a, a possibility for many people to see the same print at the same time. Then uh, from Lubin I moved to Samuel Goldwyn, who was born in Warsaw, and he was the first one who shot a long, a feature film in a place called Hollywood. It was, uh, um, it was called, it was titled a Squaw Man. And then from his his roads, he crossed with uh, with Louis B. Mayer, who started uh, the first studio, and. Uh, and then we covered the Warner Brothers, who were born also near Warsaw, who started the sound and who introduced sound into the movies and color. And then the Schubert Brothers, who brought Broadway to it, and they were born in Poland. And then a man whose name was uh, Harry Nakin Gordon, who actually was building multiplexes in 1913 already. And we thought that was a recent invention. That's not true. And then I covered uh, Pola Negri who was the first Polish-born superstar that opened up the doors for uh, Greta Garbo and Ingrid Bergman. Then Al Jolson, who was in a, a jazz singer, was the, f the, first, uh, the first singer, actor who survived the introduction of, of sound, Paul Muni and Billy Wilder. All these uh, uh, personalities were Jewish refugees from, from Eastern Europe, or most of them? Were? Can you give us a most background? Of them, most of them, uh, from out of the ten, nine were, yes. Uh, Pola, Pola Negri was actually half, um, uh, well, I hesitate to say Polish because I, you know, because my point of view is that anybody who was born in Poland is a Pole. So, so she was, uh, her, her father was a uh, Slovak gypsy. Her mother was born in Poland, but she was not Jewish. And why was it that these immigrants m were able to be so successful um, and, and uh, contribute to, to, to the development of, of early Hollywood as opposed to other immigrants like Italians and Scandinavians who, who came at the same, during the same period of time? Well, it, it's, it's a very complex question because there's a lot of issues involved. I mean, one of them, they, they came, this was the period of the Great Immigration. Okay, so who emigrated to the United States? Mostly people looking for work, and they were most of them were poorly educated. Jews, there is no illiteracy among Jews, because by the time you're 13, you have to know how to write and read. It might not be a deep knowledge, but it's a, uh, it's a step ahead of everybody. Uh, also, there was, they had no place to go. You know, the Italians came in, they figured out if we're not successful here, we will have a home to go back to. Uh, Jews from that region uh, didn't have it. It was sink or swim. Um, also, they were, because there were so many anti-Semitic and such a drastic uh, laws, especially in Russia, for example, where you know, military service was 25 years, that, uh, that uh, their entire way of thinking was how to, you know, how to circumvent those laws, th those laws, and how to how to reinvent themselves all the time. And uh, so it, it was kind of a, almost natural, you know, natural instincts. 
Now, we should mention that the book titled Pollywood is written in Polish. Why did you choose to, to, to write in Polish? Well, it's, it's for purely practical reasons. I mean, the, uh, originally I wanted to make a, a TV series out of it, and I went to Poland to, to speak to the Polish television, and, and they didn't have money, but they, they, uh, uh, while I was there, I, I, I came up with an idea of a book, and the Polish publisher very quickly offered me a contract, and so at that point it became a practical issue. And I had a very short window. I had like about nine, ten months to deliver the first uh, the first volume. So should I write in English and then translate, which would take twice as, as long, or should I just write in Polish and and uh, and then we'll try to translate this into English when we have time. Now, just as you mentioned earlier, you only covered ten names in this uh, book, but you do plan to come with 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 other books, uh, working more on 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 other names. Who, uh, and and um, the the next books, do you expect them to be in English or or Polish? Given that you perhaps might have a lang a longer time to work on. Well, I, I'm in the middle of the second volume already, and still in Polish. But the third volume is go already going to be in English, and because we will have more time. And also, uh, um, you know, there is a. Um, uh, I mean, the, this book is really a tip of an iceberg. I mean, there, there's enough materials to write probably a franchise of more than 10 books. So at that point, I think English would be the, the preferred language. You published uh, this first volume in Poland. Um, what were some of the reactions? Oh, the, 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 the reactions were, were terrific. I mean, the, the, first, the first print was, uh, the first edition was sold, in, sold out in four days. Uh, I don't know how many more editions were, what editions were up now, uh, but the, the reviews were excellent and, and it became a very popular book, it became a bestseller. What were your personal feelings as a Pole working on this book? Very mixed, <laughs> very mixed because, uh, you know, I, I was born in Poland, but Poland uh, kicked me out, so I had obviously my uh, uh, great empathy to the people I was describing. We, we in, a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, we had a shared background. On the other hand, also that uh, they, they, the book is somewhat uh, personal because there were a couple of people that I, I personally met, like Jack Warner, like like Billy Wilder. That uh, was Jack Warner less, but uh, but with Billy Wilder there was a friendship. I mean that went uh, even you know family almost ties, and so so it was it was a very personal kind of. Feeling and and then it was also painful to go, for example, in case of Billy Wilder, to go to Poland and find out that in the town where he was born in Sucha Beskitska, nobody mentions him, like he didn't exist. They know him, though. They they obviously the kids know him. The, the, everybody knows his movies, but the town, if you ask them what was, give me some famous names born in your city, Billy Wilder wouldn't be one of them. You yourself are an accomplished uh, screenwriter and, and director. Tell us more about what you will be working on, what else you have in mind aside from this project. Well, I'm, I'm working, I'm always working on something, but, uh, but right now we're preparing a, a, um, a film that uh, deals with a very, very interesting, also based on, or I should say inspired by uh, historical facts that took place in that region. And specifically, I'm talking about the, the soccer games between Poland and Soviet Union, and, and the paradox. So, uh, so the story, the, st the film I'm working on is a, is a story of a Polish team captain who in order to win in life has to lose on the field because of the politics of the, of the, of the period. So we will, hopefully we'll do it next year and we'll have some more to talk about. Andrei Krakowski, thank you very much for being in studio with us today. I appreciate being here. When we come back, why one photojournalist thinks opportunities in her field are dwindling. <laughs> the average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Visit us at stoptextstoprex.org.
And finally from us tonight, photojournalists are constantly putting themselves in harm's way to capture moments that may live in our collective memories forever. Scout Tefangian is a New York-based photojournalist who is constantly working in war-torn regions looking to present stories through her lens. Marlene Peralta tells us more. Photojournalists have made recent headlines for their unfortunate fates while covering countries in conflict. Some have been kidnapped, others killed in the line of duty. Escal Tefangian is a New York-based photojournalist who's constantly working in those same places, looking to present stories through her lens. It was a way to do journalism, which I always wanted to do without doing what I thought of as kind of book reports at the end of every day. September 11th had happened, the second intifada in Israel uh, and Palestine was kicking off, and uh, so I decided that I was going to go there. Her most recent project is not as dangerous, but very close to home. Um, and the Armenian community is an interesting one to focus on, not just because I'm Armenian, but because uh, the fact that they have their own church and their own language and their own alphabet means that the community tends to stay together much more than a lot of other communities. That sense of togetherness she's experienced from the community she has covered, regardless of their situation, has changed her life. It's possibly made me more optimistic, which is very strange. Um, you know, you, you see all of these horrible things and you see people going, you know, on the, some of the worst days of their lives and, and living in these, these horrible situations, but you also see how people survive in that. And, and not just survive, I mean, people are reading bedtime stories to their kids when they're living on the side of the road after a earthquake that killed 250,000 people. Even as Tufanjin looks back on how her profession has changed her life, she looks ahead to how the field is changing. She says the tough economic climate is making it harder and even riskier for photojournalists to get jobs these days. So instead of having people who are employed and on assignment covering conflict, you have maybe a couple people who are employed and on assignment covering conflict, and then a lot of people in their 20s running around trying to get assignments and freelancing with no support from an agency, no, uh, no support from a newspaper, no support from a magazine. So if anything happens to them, they are on their own. On their own, to sometimes deal with sexual assaults, as was the case with CBS reporter Lara Logan. Logan's case woke the world up to the issue, but for Tefangian, this is nothing new. I mean, this is a very, very, very common occurrence, and it is a big problem that, that when you're talking about uh, kind of hazardous situations or, um, or conflict zones, you're always warned about, you know, guns and tanks and helicopters and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. But women are, are not really told, oh, and by the way, you'll probably get groped all the time. She says there's a reason most women journalists don't talk about this particular issue. Women don't like telling their employers about it because uh, we don't like having, uh, having things that, that make us seem like we potentially could be in more danger than our male companions, even though we are much less likely to kind of get in a fight. The risks have been worth it for her. Her job has taken her to several countries, including Haiti, Tunisia, and Egypt, to name a few. And the thing that's wonderful about this job is it, you get the access you get into people's lives and the, the you know, the response, the, the, the trust that people give you to tell their story is really remarkable. I have, uh, I have a bunch more trips planned. Uh, Ethiopia is a place I have been trying to get to. And Marlene Peralta for Independent Sources. That's our show tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Until the next time, be independent-minded.